those of you that are put 3.0 stations together, I'm sure you, you know these products. Uh, just about everything except the programming itself and the transmitter. Everything in between. Is that, is that a good description? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Robert. But, uh, yeah, please tell us uh, how you how you think all this is converging. Thank you very much. My, my presentation is mostly an overview of different technology inside ETSC3. Most of this technology and um, solution has already been uh, explained pro previously, but I will try to give you more some technical uh, details on how it could be you know, used to enhance the end user experience. Um, I will uh, mostly focus on three different parts inside the ATAC3. Uh, the content preparation, the encoding uh, especially, even if I'm not the uh, uh, company providing the uh, compression mechanisms, I will provide you some detail on that. Uh, the protocol delivery and especially how uh, the technology uh, can be used for the ATA, uh, OTT, OTA convergence. Uh, everything has been uh, explained at the end user level by Lynn, but I would like to give you more technical detail on that. Um, the reception capability, how we can improve that uh, more than the FSFM. Um, on the broadcast overall architecture, you can see here, um, I will mostly focus on the part which is from the encoder to the transmitter. And you will see the consequences on the end user de uh, devices. So this is uh, where the technology is mostly involved and uh, all the protocol I will speak about are on the encoding, multiplexing, and the delivery to the transmitter. Um, I, I split my presentation in three parts, the presentation, the protocol, and the transmission. And as I said, I will go over these three different parts and explain you uh, what are the advantages and how we can uh, probably give more uh, a better uh, end user experience and how you can use it. At the content preparation, especially in the compression of the video, as Madeleine said at the beginning, um, we need to be sure that for the end user, you will see the difference with ATSC1. So one idea is, of course, to have a better compression using HEVC, which is the latest technology, which will allow you to make HD or 4K. But more than that, you will see later that there are other technology which could be very interesting to use uh, to be able to, um, uh, to provide a better experience for the end user. Um, making this uh, HEVC compression, of course, will give you more bitrate because the compression is four times more efficient than MPEG-2. So in the same capacity, you could imagine to have at least four times more uh, channel, TV channel. But um, of course, the idea is not necessary to increase the number of channels, but to increase the quality of this uh, TV channel. Um, for, that's the same for the audio. You can compress more the audio, but the idea is not to provide more audio. It's to provide a better experience for the end user. So how does it work? Mostly, one very interesting thing on the audio is the uh, HDR and the uh, white colored gamut. It's a capability for the, uh, the video to have more contrast. So especially on some very specific, um, let's say, video, you need to have a very, very nice contrast and to provide a very deep, um, let's say, um, sensation of contrast. So HDR is one of these technology. And you can use it um, now with your actual content. Um, my personal feeling is that uh, some people think about ATSC3 as 4K content, but it's sometimes better to have a very, very good HD quality 1080p with HDR than a poor 4K content. It's um, very interesting uh, for the end user experience to see that if you go HD, 1080p and a high frame rate, you will have a better uh, quality of video than having a poor 4K content. So my message to you is, as Madeleine said, be sure that the quality of the video will ha be higher than what you have in MPEG-1, but you can do it actually with an HD uh, uh, resolution. It's uh, something you can do now. You don't need to change everything to have a better video quality. At the audio, uh, something interesting, it's not only the compression to be able to provide you more audio tract, but the fact that the audio is made on the object base, and you can deliver a different object, and this object can be, let's say, selected by the end user. The end user will choose what you want to listen. And on one example, for example, if you have music and effect in a sport event or in, in a concert, and you have different dialogues, 
and the end user will select if you want to listen to the music and effect and the English language or the Spanish one or the French one. It doesn't matter. He will choose what you want to listen, but he will also control the volume of these different objects. So if the end user don't want to listen to the dialogue or to have a lower level of the uh, di dialogue, he will, he will be able to do that. Uh, on the other hand, if some people have some difficulty to listen or to hear, sorry, um, the, the dialogue, it could completely suppress the music and effect. That's very interesting. Another point which is interesting on that is that allow you to have a better compression because you send only once the music and effect and you send only the dialogue uh, on the other track. But another point that we could see later is that the dialogue can be sent over broadcast or over broadband. You could imagine that is an object that is sent over broadcast, the most popular language, English and Spanish. And all the other language you could imagine can be sent over broadband. The French for me, the, uh, <laughs> the Italian and so on. So you could imagine to do that, that's um, another mechanism which allow you to make the convergence of broadcast and broadband is to send part of your content over broadband. And an idea is to make it with the audio compression. This is, um, for the next step, this is the uh, protocol stack. You, you have seen it many times. It's a more simplified one. I want to highlight two points inside this protocol stack. Of course, this, you have this IP delivery that has been uh, highlighted by uh, Lynn and, and Madeleine. Um, this is very important, IP. And, um, and for the engineer which are in the room, um, everything they know about transport stream has to be a little bit forget because everything is now IP. So it's, it's, it's not a good news for, the, for them, but it's a good news for the technology because IP is really interesting. But the two points I want to highlight here is that one is you have in parallel the broadcast and broadband. So one content which is available on broadcast can also be sent on broadband. That's the, the key point. And the second point is that the protocol to send all this content over IP is based on files. The compression of the video is file-based, is dash segment or MPU segment, like what you have in, in OTT. The, um, the non-real-time applications are files. The interactive applications are HTML files. So everything you send are file-based, and then you put a protocol which are root or MPU to deliver this file over IP which could be over broadcast, or you can have HTTP and you deliver the file over broadband. So this is exactly the same content which can be sent over broadcast and broadband. You don't need to make adaptation of your content, that file base, and you deliver it. That's interesting, especially on the convergence of OTT and OTF. So um, as I said, the, uh, the, this is file base for the uh, video. So the video compression is provided as segment based, so a, a dash segment or an MPU segment, which are few segments of, uh, of uh, video, which are exactly the same of what you have in, uh, in the broadband industry. And you deliver it over the ATSC3 uh, uh, interface. And the same can be on the uh, broadband. That's why, as I said previously, you can send part of your content over broadband and part over broadcast. Another technology which could be used is scalable video encoding. I don't have slide on that, but the idea is to have, let's say, a base layer, which is HD, and an enhanced layer, which provide you the difference between HD and 4K. And you could imagine to send the HD over broadband, a broadcast, sorry, and to have the additional content which move from HD to 4K over broadband. That's an idea. That's the, the, the possibility. Um, the other point is that, uh, especially Dash, um, which is used as a packaging for the video, is very popular on the broadband industry. And any OTT player can read Dash segment. So as soon as you have the capability to deliver a Dash segment, a part of the video, to a receiver, any player which has an OTT player will be able to decode it. So it means and that the point which has been highlighted by the home gateway is that um, any, okay, any, any receiver which has an OTT player which is able to read Dash, if it's connected to the home gateway, will be able to read your content. I have two examples here. It's ha at home and in a car. So at home, you have this home gateway which will receive uh, over the air the ATSC3 and put this ATSC3 content, this Dash segment, using Wi-Fi or Ethernet cable at home to the different OTT player. 
which could be any kind of device. On Indy car, this is the same. Uh, you could have an, an ATS-C3 receiver in a car and a small Wi-Fi inside your car, and every device which are connected to this Wi-Fi in your car will be able to read the content which are delivered over ATS-C3, even if it's not an ATS-C3 uh, player. It's an OTT player which will read the, uh, the ATS-C3 content which will be received by this small home gateway inside the car. So that's very interesting because you can address a receiver which are not ATS-C3 right now. Um, interactivity has also already been explained by, by Lynn. My point of that is just to say that thanks to the convergence and the fact that you have this overlay uh, on, on top of the video, you can put the uh, live linear TV as a primary content for the end user and all the on-demand content as a secondary uh, content to be sure that for you, the end user will start watching by the live and then access to the on-demand content, but not on the opposite way to put your live content as a primary and the main channel the end user want to see first, and then to give them access to on-demand content. That's very important to be sure that it's, uh, it's on this way and not on this opposite way. Um, on the RF part, um, it has been covered also a little bit previously. Um, these are the difference between ATSC1 and ATSC3. The big uh, point you have to understand for ATSC3 is that you have the choice to choose the robustness, the coverage, and the bandwidth of your signal. It's up to you. Um, you have a lot of different parameters in ATSC3 modulation to provide you this different uh, capability. And this chart gives you an idea of what you could imagine from two megabits per second for a six megahertz channel up to more than 50 megabits per second. You can choose the robustness and the bandwidth of your six megahertz channel. Of course, two megabits is probably low for a six megahertz and 56 is probably difficult to be received. So this is a trade-off between coverage, robustness, and bandwidth. You choose that. And most of uh, the trial are around 25 megabits, but there are some deployments which are using more than 35 or 40 megabits per second. Especially, and we, we come back to this SFN situation, especially if you put SFN in place because you could have a, a signal which is not very robust, but thanks to SFN, you will have a very nice coverage, allow everybody to receive this, uh, this signal. So you, you choose your, uh, your bandwidth according to the robustness of the signal, and you put in place your coverage with different transmitters. One point with that is um, you have to choose the robustness of your signal. And some people can say, I want to address different kind of receiver. How I can do that? So there is a mechanism inside ATSC3 which is called um, L oh, which is called PLP, physically your pipe, which allows you to do that. Let me explain you how does it work. In ATSC1, you have one multiplex in six megahertz channel, which has uh, the same, uh, let's say, all bits have exactly the same robustness and the same coverage. What has been done in ATSC3 is the idea to be able to split your six megahertz channel in different pipe, and each pipe can have its own modulation, can have its own robustness and coverage. So you can split your frequency in different robustness to be able for you to target different receiver in your six megahertz channel. How does it work? Typically, an example, I will choose uh, one pipe with a very, let's say, robust signal which will be used to send the content for a very indoor, indoor reception or audio channel. I will have another pipe which will have a, a middle, uh, let's say, robustness which will be for SD or HD channel which will be for indoor reception with the indoor antenna. And I can imagine to have a higher a PLP which will be very, um, let's say, very large in terms of bandwidth with a, a small, uh, some um, poor indoor reception, but could be received with the outdoor antenna. So you can, as this example, you can split your frequency in different pipe and uh, uh, dedicate the content to the receiver you want to, to address. That's in, in the technology of ATS history. Um, 
Um, hmm. uh, SFN is my last slide. It has been covered many times uh, today, but what I would like to say is SFN is part of the standard and can be done right now. It's not an option. As soon as you have one transmitter, it's already SFN capable. I'm, I mean that you can start with your high power now, and as soon as you have a poor reception or you see that there are reception which need to be improved, you can add a second transmitter which is exactly the same frequency. It's not a repeater or gap filler or something like this. It does not use another frequency. And you can use it uh, now. You can make it step by step. I mean that you don't need to wait uh, or you don't need to put uh, an SFN in place right now. You can make it with your antenna and in increase the coverage later on. It's already in the, in the ATSC3 specification and every ATSC3 let's say, on-air signal are SFN compatible right now due to this technology. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Richard, and uh, thanks for sponsoring too, by the way. And this is one of the sponsors here, which allowed this to happen, and by the fault of food. We're, we're going to do a few questions, and then we'll be doing a break. Um, any questions for Richard? Yeah. Uh, Do the SFN sites need to be synchronized? Yeah. Uh, every SFN transmitter has to be synchronized, and the synchronization timestamp is provided by an equipment which is called the broadcast gateway at the studio side. So in the studio, you have the broadcast gateway, which packs everything, provide the timestamp information, send over the STL link with this STLTP protocol. All the transmitter has this STLTP input and synchronized all together thanks to that. And most of the transmitter are using the GPS to be able to have the timestamp information. And at the studio, you have also a GPS or a NTP, PTP clock. So at the station, it's uh, delayed to give time for the remote sites to get the signal? The, the, at the studio, you deliver the timestamp. And on each transmitter, they can put some delay to ensure that all the transmitter will deliver the same content at the same moment. So you have what is called a maximum network delay to ensure that each transmitter will buffer the, the necessary time to deliver the content at the same time. So yes, Thank everything you. is uh, is defined in, in the standard. Any more questions for Richard or Lynn? Let's do. We're recording. Let's do the. Uh, so is that synchronization agile? If I have a um, if I have a uh, disaster recovery STL that somehow has more delay than my primary STL, do all of those resynchronize when I when one of them fails over to the backup STL? Um, I, I will say yes and no. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, if your timestamps are very different and the, the delay between your back disaster recovery site and the transmitter are very different from the actual studio. In that case, there will be a desynchronization and resynchronization, which take a few seconds. It's not a lot. Uh, the most important is the transmitter to power down and power up, which is more uh, time consuming. But if you put in place solution which ensure that the delay between your main site and the disaster have mostly the same delay to the transmitter, then you can try, you, you should be able to have a, a, a seamless transition. Any more for Richard or Lynn? Oh. Could you get, uh, uh, we're recording it, so let's use the mic. You mentioned about uh, crossing over between the broadcast side and possibly filling in things with broadband content. How are those two pointing at each other to know where where the fill-ins are happening? Um, when, when a linear service is delivered, there is uh, exactly what you have in OTT. You have what we call an MPD file, which describes the content, and you have some tables like SLS, the equivalent to the PMT table in ATC1. And inside this information, you know where the content is. If it's from broadband, if it's for broadcast, and you have the link how to access to this content. So typically, if you have the video and one audio track which is on broadcast, the description is where to find this in the broadcast uh, link. And you can have a link, a, a broadband link for an additional audio track. 
So this is a, there is a description like a, like the PMT table, which is SLS, which contains the MPD, which describe all these different tracks. Okay, the link. thank you. Anybody else? A lot of broadcasters in this room. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, out of all the attributes and advantages of this next-gen TV system, is it, what do you think? What's your opinion? Uh, Will the audio be what the consumers are interested in? The video? Will it be the reception? Uh, some of you have even worked with ATSC3. Like Matt, you've got a, you had a station on for about a year, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, did you get any uh, feedback from any viewers on what they thought was the, what was it, the reception? Uh, well, when we were running the test station, uh, there were probably two receivers in the market. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> so Mr. Goodman liked the, but, you know, but also the, the a question I had though was uh, in these new receivers that are coming out, how much, how many of these whiz, whiz bang features are actually enabled now? Um, like the audio being able to pull the dialogue up, is there a way to do that? Or that, you know, this is this is coming from an RF guy, so I don't I don't know how any the encoding people here or yeah. uh, anybody that went to CES that knows about the. Uh, about the uh, dialogue en enhancement? Because that's this, what I'm s reading, and when I talk to people about this, the, their best part is being able to bring the dialogue up and down. Yeah, that's one feature of uh, AC4. I believe, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're AC4 compatible, but are, are the receivers set up so you could actually dial that in? Easily, you mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So you think that's probably one of the, it's, well, it's very simple, but you think it's one of the most uh, useful features? That seems to be the one that caught everybody's eye to start with, you know. With, a lot of these other stuff uh, that haven't been pointed out and until right. the consumer knows, mm -hmm. then uh, they don't know what, what they're missing, really. Anybody done any broadcasting in Europe, multi-language or, or personalization? Any experience with that? I know that's a capability of, uh, of uh, ATSC3. Anybody have any case studies on that or, or experimented with it? Uh, Chris, what do you think? Uh, think it's going to be the audio, the video, the reception? What do you think is going to be the biggest pull for this? Or I think consumers want to get the content wherever they are. So I don't, you know, I think a better picture, better sound. I mean, you watch some of the stuff now. I was watching some last night, and the commercials come on and just blast you out of the chair, and you got to you know, mute the audio. But I think initially it's, being able to receive the content on any device anywhere and when they want it, where they want it. You know, that one of the arguments is, well, 5G is going to come out with this quicker delivery of the content, you know, better quality. I, I don't know if that matters. I think if it's just the reception. Can they get it anywhere? Because that's the biggest, right now we're on our AUX channel for the repack. The biggest complaint of the court case is, when are you going to come back just so we can receive you? It's not so much anything in hand, you know, they're watching UK, which we have as a, it's an SD channel, it's super popular, the quality of that video is not great, we're trying to improve it, but I think initially it's, can they receive the content wherever they are on whatever device, as easy as they can right now with their phone and, and, and other applications. Mm -hmm. they, you know, can't do that. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I think the um, alternate audio is going to be a bigger deal, but I think it's very targeted. I think your NASCAR fans are going to be listening to the team audio. They've been they've been renting cans when they go to a race okay. to do that for almost 20 years where you can... Personalized audio. Personalized audio. Right. And I saw a demo actually in this room where somebody was showing uh, comedy commentators mm -hmm. as an alternate audio for soccer games. And it was a riot. Comedy for you'd, soccer. Ac okay. you'd actually have comedians doing commentary uh -huh. uh, on a uh, on a sports event. Um, mm -hmm. They did that on a uh, the Rose Bowl parade. They had a couple comedians uh, doing commentary, and it was like an alternate audio. So I mean, I think it's going to be kind of specialized. I, I think the more important question is what's useful for the broadcaster, as opposed to what the consumers are going to be interested in. And and I think being able to identify your viewers individually. Uh, whether you're a commercial broadcaster or uh, a uh, public broadcaster, 
the ability to know your audience as an individual instead of as a demographic group, I think is going to be, you know, kind of the winning application for, for all of us who have to make a business out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, George, any uh, talk at NPT, uh, what, what, what is, uh, advantages this might system? I know it's in the future, but uh, any thoughts or talk about uh, what, what the uh, new formats could offer? Oh, there you go. Well, you know, I think the format's going to do a lot, but I, I agree with, with Chris that it's wanting to be my own programmer and to see what I want, when I want, where I want. So, you know, how many of us watch anything in real time anyway? I want to start it 15 minutes late and just scan through. And now that Comcast with the X1 puts those tabs in, you know, it goes right through commercials. So uh, I think that's the, the game. It's it's always has been, certainly as long as I've been in this business, it's the content. And people are going to watch what they want. And if we can get it there, that's that's really important. Hockey and Punjab, they've been, doing, they've been having some success with that in Canada. I'm not kidding. Hockey in, with a Punjab dot narration. I'm not joking. Apparently they the CBC and Rogers tie up for the hockey con NHL contract there. That's one of the things they did to broaden the audience for the product. So with 5G being around the corner and fiber potentially hitting houses within the next five years, what is ATSC offering that couldn't be accomplished through an application on a phone or a tablet and sent to the internet? Uh, maybe <laughs> Madeline, Lynn, uh, Skip, yeah. That's a good question. Well, a couple of things. Um, I think, first of all, uh, 5G in all of the band widths, all of the frequency bands that it's contemplated for, um, from 600 all the way up to the, the, the uh, millimeter wavelengths, is not going to have the same penetration as the uh, ATSC 3.0 wavelengths, no matter what you do. Um, I think the other thing is that you know, think about the, the sweet spot for data delivery using different um, radio access networks. So for Wi-Fi, the sweet spot is, in, is within a local area. And for 5G, perhaps the sweet spot is unicast back and forth conversations and not large amounts of data. Um, because I think that, uh, at least I've heard and I've seen some research that says that sending a data packet over the cellular network, if you're, for example, Ford OnStar, is expensive. Um, and after the 5G build out and the amount of CapEx that's going to go into that, I could envision that uh, at least at first, sending data over the 5G network is going to be expensive. Um, so you think about the use cases. Um, and if you have a use case where it's a one to many use case, it's a large amount of data, it's going to a lot of receivers. Um, in fact, the broadcast network might be the best way to do it. And the translation for that is the cheapest, fastest, and most efficient way to do it. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting right now is that there is a broadcast standard within the 3GPP world. Um, the current one is called MBMS. Uh, it was used for media flow, uh, which was experimented with a while ago. Um, that is an LTE standard, not a 5G standard, but uh, probably they're going to port some part of that or most of it or the advanced version of it into 5G someday soon. Um, and the advancement from MBMS is EMBMS, and after that, FEMBMS. Uh, e meaning enhanced and F meaning further, so further enhanced MBMS. Um, my understanding right now, uh, looking at some studies that were published in the IEEE uh, transaction on broadcasting, is that the next gen television standards for broadcast um, are far better than MBMS, EMBMS, or FEMBMS uh, in terms of capacity and in fact in terms of the ability to reach a moving target. So we, we compensate for Doppler effect better because we have larger guard intervals and cyclic prefixes. So right now, for the one-to-many use case, um, actually ATSC 3.0 and, and DVB-T2 also um, are better than the LTE MBMS. Um, I think the other thing to consider is that uh, if people are thinking about delivering 
television to televisions using what might eventually be 5G broadcast. Um, and you think to yourself, well, we're going to automatically be in TVs because we're doing broadcast, and we're automatically going to be in phones. Actually, it's kind of hard. Um, right now, MBMS is in some phones on silicon, uh, for example, in India. EMBMS and FEMBMS are in zero phones and on zero silicon that, that we know of. And getting a, a 5G tuner or you know receiving device in your smart TV that's also not necessarily a home run and easy to do. So thinking long term, um, you know, you look at broadcasters, and if we are able to build out this 3.0, and we are able to create a nationwide wireless delivery network, um, we could see ourselves sitting in a pretty nice sweet spot within the world of 3GPP. And I think the other piece to add to that is that uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a competitive environment. As I say, different networks for different purposes. And in fact, uh, 3GPP has contemplated that. So in release 15, um, there is a section in the document, section 6.1.3, am I, am I right, Mark? Section 6.1.3, um, that actually talks about non-5G radio access networks as being part of the ecosystem. And they fall into two camps, trusted and non-trusted. Trusted being non-5G networks that the cellular operator operates and non-trusted being those that the cellular operator uses but doesn't operate. Um, right now, I think uh, IEEE SA is busy working on getting Wi-Fi as one of the non-trusted networks, and the satellite uh, industry is busy getting satellite as uh, to be potentially accepted within 3GPP as one of the non-trusted networks. Um, I see no reason why ATSC3 could not also be considered for that, um, but uh, that's that's down the road. So. We'll see how that plays out, but um, at least for now, I would see ATSC 3.0 and other, other next-gen TV systems um, as being uh, very complementary in a 5G world for certain use cases um, and using the best network for the purpose at, at hand. Thanks. Okay. Can I, can I have a follow-up on that? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Thank you, Madeline. So, I think one of the other thoughts there is that unlike, let's say, a Verizon or T-Mobile, the broadcasters are content creators and content owners and have direct personal relationships with their consumers. They have a brand with their consumers related to content. You know, so they're, with ATSC 3.0, you're much more like a Netflix where you really control that whole end-to-end -end delivery and you can create apps and you can create experiences in a way that someone who is just a transport service provider or carrier cannot do. Because the di unique difference is you actually can create content that leverages this, and you can own that relationship with the consumer. And I think we need to make sure that as we go forward, we think about how do we really exploit this technology to do that and leverage that capability. Yeah, it, OK. Yeah, thanks, Peter. An excellent point. And I think a case in point uh, to, to, your, to your comment is emergency messaging. So we know we have wireless emergency alerts. Um, and I believe that the wireless carriers um, were reluctant carriers of these messages. Um, they are not interested in what the message is. Uh, and I think they, in fact, fought for and won complete indemnification. Um, we will carry y'all's message. Uh, but if anything goes wrong with it, don't blame us. And if there's anything wrong with the message, don't blame us. And if anybody gets hurt because of it, don't blame us. And the government said, okay. So they're, they're a pipe. And they're delivering a message from somewhere to people um, because they were told to. Whereas the, con the broadcast community cares about these messages, curates these messages, enhances them, and in some cases even creates them for their local community. So you think about how much care we put into, or broadcasters put into the message that they would be sending in an emergency situation to their communities. And I think that's, a, that's sort of an illustration of Peter's point about broadcasters being content creators as well as content distributors. Um, and you imagine getting these emergency messages to the car while you're busy driving in the direction of the flash flood um, and the car finding out, hey, you know what, you might want to turn around here. Um, so. Looking at the broadcast community um, for that particular type of content, I think, is also uh, very critical. Yeah, uh, I think and the, 
you, you hit on a nerve, obviously, there, this is a big issue right now, um, and it, it, it's being considered all over the world, literally. Um, a, and you see the answers coming down to two things, one about technology, one about fundamental business differences, and I think the one that I'd be remiss not to mention that hasn't been mentioned already because there's both r really good responses already uh, is the, the whole free-to-air model. Um, it, when you say 5G, you typically assume it's being operated by wireless telco operators who fundamentally have a subscription business model. Um, and with apologies to public broadcasters who wish broadcasting worked that way too. I understand as a, a recovering public broadcaster myself um, that the, the fact is that we live in a free-to-air environment and that's, that, that, that's the way the system is designed to work. Infinite scalability, um, whereas uh, a, a wireless doesn't. Now, that said, there are models in that effort EMBMS that allows us what they call a SIM cardless receiver um, that's really essentially like a broadcast receiver, sort of infinitely scalable, um, doesn't require a subscription to pick up, but are the wireless telcos going to devote bandwidth to that? Because if they do, they have to reduce bandwidth for their money-making unicast services. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons, but we've already, at any we've talked to a, a number of the wireless folks, and they said, yeah, we don't see that as a business opportunity for us going forward. The, the provision of broadcast, maybe in some really like on Super Bowl or something, but even then they've, they've tried it and it's, it's not been a, a, a great success. It'll probably evolve. The two systems will kind of go down the same path at about the same time. And one of the things that we broadcasters and, and wireless folks are already talking about is how they can work together on the production side. 5G could be a great boon to the backhaul business for, for, for broadcasters and, and we're looking forward to that. And again, just to plug, um, we'll be talking about both of those elements, the delivery yeah, side talk more and, about the, about and the, and the uh, backhaul yeah. side yeah. at yeah. the NAB show uh, at some length um, as to how 5G and broadcast will intersect in the future. So it's, a, it's an open question, an important one, but in terms of a delivery model where some folks have already said, this too little too late for ATSC3 or DVB-T2 or any of these new services because 5G is going to do it all. You know, I cure cancer and everything else. Well, well, it's added. Uh, that that hype, I think, is way overplayed. Um, but the devil is in the details of how the two will evolve, and they they will evolve together. And we think in in pretty um, important ways for broadcasters to use both technologies uh, to to the, uh, the broadcasting's and the consumers' uh, benefit. And we're going to have a lot more opinions about that later in the day. Uh, everybody hungry? We have some more uh, hold on. food uh, for, for Fred, break. Hold on I a second. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I sort of wanted to wrap yeah. this conversation maybe back around to the initial one that was brought up about audio, right? What feature sets are going to be in TV sets as they uh, as they uh, as they come out? Uh, and there there is fundamental agreement on a launch strategy on the part of broadcasters with the CTA in terms of a nominal set of uh, functionality that'll be in there. All of this other discussion is exceptionally important because it's about our future. I can tell you one of the things that's probably the most difficult part of that is that there are not enough standards wonks in the universe at this time dealing with uh, ATSC uh, on, on a liter literally on a global level. Uh, you know, there's activity underway in India for standardization, many parts of this LTE and 5G offload strategy. Uh, that, that is heading to, uh, to 3GPP for standardization, but it takes people, it takes time, it takes energy, uh, and I'll tell you, anybody who wants to volunteer for that, uh, let someone know, <laughs> uh, because it's much needed. But at NAB, you will see uh, the, the first uh, commercial operated ATSC3 next-gen station with full network uh, approval to carry NBC programming. That NBC programming uh, will be offered in 1080p HDR, all right? So uh -huh. if, yep. if you want to add to the sort of the list, you got to think about this as an incremental list. You start with audio, you, think, you talk about dialogue enhancement, all right? That'll be there. You're talking about HDR, 
Uh, if you're doing a decent job of the encoding, uh, uh, it, you know, the upscaling of that uh, is, uh, is, is good. And HDR is more of an eye popper than, uh, than yeah, virtually resolution. anything right. else yeah. uh, in, in the, you know, in the standard side of that equation. And I'll, I'll just throw a teaser out there and I won't comment any more than this. Don't be surprised if you see a telephone at NAB with a built-in broadcast receiver. I did want to take a moment to um, highlight some of our sponsors with which this program would not be possible. By the way, uh, because of our sponsors and the support we got here, we are going to have a cocktail reception down the street at Busboys and Poets between 6 and 8. So I hope uh, most of you can make it for that. Uh, enough of hors d'oeuvres, so you probably won't have to get dinner. So, And an open bar. So we can keep discussing this as time goes on. Uh, I'm going to mention the names and whoever is here from the company, if you could just raise your hand. American Tower, right? Um, uh, Tim, yeah. Uh, AES, is Vinny here? AES was one of the sponsors. Uh, Elenos Group, which includes Broadcast Electronics. Oh, there you are. And Dielectric, Christine here? Okay. Oh, two, two people. And a lot of these uh, sponsors have... Uh, have uh, boots and literature and swag, so uh, please thank the sponsors. We're going to do a break right now.